This morning's invocation, Lord God, Heavenly Father, on this beautiful summer morning, we thank you that we can gather in the warmth of your church body and in the light of your risen Son, Jesus. We ask that the Holy Spirit feed us with this worship time and with Pastor Mark's message, and we offer it all up to you as a love offering. So let us all join together in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Father, who art in heaven, I would be thy name, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Shutesbury Community Church this morning. Welcome to our guest. It's nice to have you. Uh, there are a few announcements, but before we get to that, I would like to take just a minute and pray for John um, Menino, Jr., who is right now at urgent care with a problem with his eye and no idea what it is. So. Let's just, while he's there and they're looking at him, let's have a quick prayer for him. Lord, we just pray right now that you will uh, be there with John and with the doctors that are looking at him this morning, that you will um, help them to quickly discover what's going on with his eye and uh, help him to quickly heal, especially since the family wedding is only six days away. Lord, he's a wonderful part of our church and we pray your protection upon him. In Jesus' name, amen. So, today is Communion Day, so those of you who are at home, if you would like to participate in Communion, you can prepare your elements and be ready at the end of the service. Next week is Food Pantry. Um, I'd also like to talk right after church with any members of the Property Committee who are here, there are three I think, uh, if more don't come in, and see if we can figure out when to hold a meeting. 
the, uh, there needs to be an organizational meeting with a decision on who's going to be the chairman and so forth. Um, also, we have decided to take a month off from Bible study because so many people are on vacation. So we're going to take August off and we will resume on September 6th, which is uh, Labor Day is very early this year. September 6th is the Wednesday after Labor Day. So um, if you are not on the email list to receive a Zoom link and you would like to be on it, uh, which serves as a reminder and also enables you to participate if we're not having it at the church or if you choose not to come, then let me know your email address and I will add you to the list. Are there any other announcements today? Oh, we are continuing with the prayer hour at 6.15. It'll probably be only on Zoom and phone, but we are happy to have anyone. I'll be sending out that Zoom link. So anyone is welcome to join us. We pray for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the church, for our, our community, our country, all the people in the church. We pray for the world. So we would love to have more people join us in that prayer effort that we have each week at 6.15 p.m. on Wednesdays. Are there any other announcements? And let us take our voices and our songs to the Lord this morning. If anyone would like to join the choir, which today is only one person, um, please feel free to come on up. A thousand generations Falling down and worshiped, sing the song of ages to the land. All who have gone before us, all who will believe, sing the song of ages to the land. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and petitions your name stands above them all the angels cry holy our creation cries holy Above 
is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above all thoughts and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above all and the angels cry holy our creation cries holy you are Places. O Lord of hosts, my soul longs and even yearns for the courts of the Lord. My heart, my flesh sings for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house and a swallow a nest for itself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Salah. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion, passing through the valley of Baca. They make it a spring, and early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength, every one of them appearing before God in Zion. O oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give my ear, O God of Jacob, Selah, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you.
Oh Lord, we do long to worship you. We long to worship you with our songs of praise, with our prayers, with our times of silence where we just sit in your presence. Times when we're with each other, comforting and laughing and supporting. Because Lord, all of that is praise and worship to you. Because you are our God and our King. And you are our Father. And we are your children, and you want us to be together, to lift each other up, to help our brothers and sisters carry their burdens, to be encouragers, to be that ear and that support during times of pain and suffering. And Lord, we do thank you for all that you do for us because you are such a loving and merciful God. And Lord, we just lift up this whole church family to you. So many things going on. And Lord, just we pray for your peace and your calm during the times of sometimes chaos or illness, times when things just don't seem to be going right. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for those things that are just so unbelievably a gift from you. And Lord, we want to lift up Peggy as she will be coming home next week from Colorado. We pray for Gabe and Mari as they're going to be exchanging vows this coming weekend, and they will be united in you. Lord, we pray for those that are um, just really struggling with some health issues. We pray for Johnny as he's at urgent care. I pray for my brother Matt, who will be having surgery to fix his um, heart valve. Lord, we just thank you, because we know that we can leave these prayer requests and we can leave these things in your hands and know with confidence that your will will be done, that you will be there to love and support each and every one. And Lord, there's just no better um, foundation to build our lives on than you as our rock, our solid foundation of hope and peace and love and joy. And we just pray for our country during this upcoming months and the elections. Lord, we just pray for wisdom and guidance as we vote. We just pray for each and every elected official that we have that is in a position to change rules and regulations and change and shape the future of this country that we love so much. And Lord, we just pray for your wisdom and your guiding hand to be in every situation. Lord, we just pray for your justice and we just pray for your love to reign supreme. And we just thank you for all that you do for us. And we love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, just a couple more things as part of prayer. Um, Barbara's home from the nursing home, and so we want to pray for her. Chris has surgery on Friday, so we want to pray for Chris. And uh, Charlie is recuperating pretty well from his uh, surgery, but we want to pray for his continued recuperation. And I don't know that anyone else has had any immediate issues, but let's pray. Lord, we just pray for those three people um, that your love and your blessings will be upon each one of them and that you will bring total healing to them, Lord. And bring peace to Barbara and Pam and Charlie um, as they as they settle into this um, having Barbara back home from the nursing home. And Lord, anyone else who may have uh, issues in their life, whether medical, whether um, spiritual or financial, we just pray for your help with those things. We pray for Carrie, who is looking at knee surgery in the in the near future. And so we pray that goes well too, Lord. And we thank you for your love and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So <clears throat> it is time for our offering this morning. 
And if Nancy could come forward and take that up, please. Please rise for the doxology, those who are able. Father, blessed one, you who has blessed us so greatly, we give you our thanks for those blessings. And as we give back a portion today that it be used in this church, we pray that it will be used in your will and to your glory here in this church, in the community, and around the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if our one choir member would come forward for our children's song. We have no children today. <clears throat> Samson was a judge in Israel. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Samson was, was a judge, judge in Israel. Yes, he was. finding just the right song and um, she doesn't think we did find just the right song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, we had a choice between hokey and gory. Gory, so, right. <laughs> uh, we chose hokey. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. Well, the sermon's going to be a little uh, gory. So we got letters from, before we get into the sermon, 
I don't need this one. We got letters. Turn this up a little. In the building. This one. Is your mic on? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I didn't turn it on. <laughs> Ta-da. Uh, is that better? Yes. Yeah. We got letters, uh, thank you cards from the Alternative Pregnancy Center of um, Greenfield. We had our baby bottle drive a couple months ago, and they've had a new baby born, um, a baby girl. So they're very happy about that. And we, in total, donated, including the 300 that we donate as part of our missions, um, they, we donated a total of $808.54. So. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I know that um, Brenda uh, and Lori have donated with the church in the past, but I think they're donating separately now. They've developed a relationship, so it's higher than that, I'm sure. <sighs> Let's pray. Lord, as we go into your word this morning, we just pray that your message will come out loud and clear. That what you want us to learn from this story of Samson, that you will place that in our hearts and our minds. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us this wonderful book full of insight and knowledge, full of direction for our lives. And we pray that each one of us will spend more time in it and spend more time with the Holy Spirit as we look through it and learn more about you, about ourselves, and about our relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was watching the Olympics this past week, and I was interested to see, um, was watching the super heavyweight boxing. And I do like boxing. I know a lot of people don't, but I do. I didn't when I was younger, um, but I do. And I noticed there was a Ukrainian named Dmitro Lovchinsky. Well, when you are watching a sport and it doesn't have an American in it, you look for a reason to root for one or the other of the participants or teams. So I thought, well, being Ukrainian and with their plight and their situation, well, I could root for him. So I decided I would do that. He was a Big man, because it was super heavyweight, 6'3", probably went 220, I would guess. The weight class starts at 200, I would say about 220. And he seemed like a good bet to win. Not that I was going to bet, but I was going to root. And then his opponent came into the ring. This was an Australian boxer who was descended from a Cook Islands tribe. And he stood 6'7", weighed 265 pounds, which I learned with a quick Google search because I wanted to know. And he looked like a towering behemoth with his long hair gathered up in a leather warrior's wrap going down the back of his neck. And I said, there's no way this poor Ukrainian is going to win this boxing match. No way. And his name, by the way, was as big and impressive as he was. Tara Moana Sampson Jr. Leon Tara Moana. I don't know why he had the same first and last name, but he did. So he was Tara Moana Tara Moana Jr. officially. But his two middle names were Sampson and Leon. Well, it just so happened that we were doing Samson this week, so I thought that was really appropriate. And it was an appropriate name for him because he delivered the most powerful blows that I've seen in a long time, and that poor Ukrainian didn't make it through the first round. He ended up twice on the mat and the second time unable to get back up. Here's a picture of him. Now, don't show that out on Facebook because it's copyrighted. But anyone who is watching on Facebook can do a quick Google search and see 
the difference between these two boxes. And you can tell which one is which. So we move today in our Revisiting Children's Bible Stories Summer Series into the book of Judges, and specifically to the Judge Samson. We don't think of Samson as being a judge. We think of him being a warrior, but that's what the judges were at that time. They were military leaders, primarily, for the Israelite nation. And the Israelite nation wasn't really yet a nation. It was separate tribes living separately, but coming together sometimes for military purposes. And so God would give them a judge, they called it, and he would lead them. This went on for about 350 years between the end of Joshua's command and the coronation of King Saul. The overall theme of Judges is summed up nicely in Judges 17.6. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Now you can imagine what that was like. Because what the Israelites saw fit to do was fight with one another within their tribe, or tribe against tribe, fight the neighboring nations, which were all supposed to have been driven out by Joshua and his armies, but were not. And so they were still around, the Canaanites, the Philistines, uh, the Ammonites, and so forth. And even sometimes fight with God himself and worship idols, false gods. So by the time Samson came along, God had had enough of it. And so he said in Judges 13.1, or Judges 13.1 says, again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Sometimes God does that puts us in tough places because we haven't obeyed, we haven't followed, and we need some redirection. Now during those 40 years, Samson was born, and he was chosen by God, which we're going to find out about in a minute, to be a judge over the Israelite people. So let's go into our picture story that we've been doing each week in this children's revisited series and look at part of Samson's story. Warrior for God. After the death of Abdon, the judge, the Israelites again began to do evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. In the village of Zorah was a woman who was barren. The angel of the Lord came to her and said, you will become pregnant and have a son. His head is never to be touched by a razor, for he is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the Philistines, he said. The baby was born and named Samson, and the Lord blessed him as he grew strong and tall. His hair was never cut, and he did not drink wine or eat fruit of the vine, as God required of Nazarites. One day, Samson was in Timnah in Philistia. All that brown on the right side is the Philistine lands, um, which was problematic for the Israelites for centuries. And he saw a young woman. He returned home and told his parents, I have seen a Philistine woman. Get her for my wife. Her parents said, isn't there even one woman among all the Israelites you could marry? Why must you go to the pagan Philistines? But Samson said, get her for me. She's the right one. Her parents did not know this was from the Lord. On his way to Timnah to arrange the marriage, Samson was attacked by a lion. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, and he tore the lion apart with his bare hands. When he returned later for the wedding, he found a beehive in the lion's carcass and he stopped to eat some honey. Samson threw a feast with 30 young men from Timnah, and he said, I have a, a riddle. 
If you solve it, I will give you 30 sets of fine clothes. But if you don't, you give me 30 sets of clothes. The riddle was, out of the one who eats came something to eat. Well, when the men could not solve the riddle, they told Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Later, she threw herself on Samson, sobbing, you don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. So he told her. When the men told Samson the answer, he was furious. If you had not plowed with my heifer, I love that phrase, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle, he said. He went down to the Philistine town of Ashkelon and killed 30 men. He took their clothes and gave them to the men of Timnah. Then Samson went home and stayed for a time with his parents. When he returned to Timnah to see his wife, his, her father would not let him in. I was so sure you hated her, I gave her to your companion, he said. Her younger sister is more attractive. Take her instead. Samson was furious. This time, I have a right to get even with the Philistines, he said. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes, tied them tail to tail in pairs, and fastened a torch to their tails. It was harvest time, so he lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the grain fields. He burned up the grain, plus the vineyards and the olive groves. The Philistines asked, who did this? And they were told, Samson, because his wife was given to his companion. So the Philistines went up and burned Samson's wife and her father to death. Samson swore to take revenge on the Philistines. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many. Then he went and stayed in a cave in the rock of Etam. And so ends this portion of our story about Samson. So this is just the beginning of Samson's story as a judge, which goes on for 20 years before, <coughs> excuse me, before he dies in a dramatic scene in the Philistine temple of Dagon, the god, in Gath. And I'm sure you all know the story of Samson and Delilah and the way it ends with Samson destroying the temple by toppling the columns that supported the roof of the temple. Interestingly, archaeologists have discovered two different, uh, the remains of two different temples in the Philistine area, not the one in Gath, which is the one that the Bible says Samson was at, but two others that they found in the region that were destroyed by toppling caused by their two central columns being collapsed. And they conjecture that it was an earthquake that did those, and perhaps it was, and when the two central columns fell, then the whole rest of the temple fell like a deck of cards, the archaeologists describe it. So here are the remains of one of those temples, and you can see those white bases of the pillars. They were close together, right there, right in the center of the temple, with wooden pillars going up to hold the, the ceiling up. So you can see how it's quite possible for a strong person where these columns were only seven feet apart to reach out and push those, those columns. There was no support for the columns on those platforms. They just, the weight of the roof was the only thing that held them on those platforms, those foundations. And so if they were pushed hard, they could certainly have fallen down. And if they fell down, it all fell down. So let's take a look at the events through the rest of Samson's life. He hid in the cave at Etam, 
And the Philistines went up to Judah to get him and bring him back to Philistia for punishment. But he wasn't there. But they told the men of Judah that he was looking for him and why he was, they, were, they were looking for him. And the men of Judah, 3,000 of them, knowing Samson's great strength, 3,000 of them went down to Etam and they got Samson. And they said to Samson, don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? So Samson let them tie him up with ropes. But as they approached the Philistine village, the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, the Bible tells us, and the ropes fell away. Samson found the jawbone of a dog, donkey, and with it he struck down 1,000 Philistines. The Bible says, then Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. He was a poet, too, as well as a judge. Later, Samson went to Gath, where he spent time with a prostitute. And the Philistines learned he was there and plotted to kill him at dawn. But Samson got up in the middle of the night, and verse 6, 3 says, then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now that hill was nearly 40 miles away. He carried the gates of the city all that way. And that brings us to the famous story of Samson and Delilah, which has been made into numerous movies, a great love story. Of course, it wasn't a great love story. The Bible doesn't say how their relationship began. It only says that Samson fell in love with this beautiful woman, Delilah. And the Philistines, finding that out, finally figured they had a way to kill this Superman that had been plaguing them for so long. Verse 16, 5 says, the rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. Now that 1,100 shekels is about 28 pounds. So 28 pounds of silver, times however many of these rulers were gonna donate, was a significant amount, it was a, a fortune. And so Delilah was more than happy to go along and try to figure out how to kill her lover. Samson was protective of the source of his strength, of course, so it took a while. She had to trick him this way and that way and this way and that way. But finally, we come to verse 16 and 17, which says, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. You women remember that. So he told her everything, the power of nagging. So Delilah waited until Samson was asleep and she cut off his hair. The Philistines seized him, they gouged out his eyes, and they dragged him off to Gaza where they bound him and put him to work grinding grain in a prison. And they always show the pictures of the, old, the huge grain things with the big, the big stones in the center and these like telephone poles almost coming out and you walk around in a circle pushing this heavy, heavy thing. And poor Salmon with his short hair for the first time in his life, um, bound in, in chains and pushing this humongous uh, grain grinder, if you will. But no one thought to keep his hair cut, which is kind of a funny thing. And if they knew the secret to his strength, why wouldn't they keep his hair cut? But they didn't. Well, the Philistine rulers all came together at the temple of Dagon, the god, 
And one of them decided, hey, let's have this strong man Samson come out and he can entertain us. And so they called for him. And he went out and his hair had grown back. Now all the Philistine rulers were in the temple and 3,000 more people were up on the roof of the temple, hanging out. They did that in the Middle East, they still do. They have what we have our backyards with our decks and stuff. They have rooftop decks and they hang out on the roof. So all these 3,000 people were up there on the roof of this big temple. <coughs> and Samson stood by the central columns and he prayed, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. And then he braced himself against the columns and he said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. And that's the end of Samson's story. A dramatic and exciting ending. So what are we to make of this disturbing story about this warrior man who God seemingly supported this crude, angry, vengeful, prideful man whose motivation was obviously not to serve God, but to serve himself. And yet, every time he came into a situation, we hear or we read, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Oh, God was there supporting him. A man who, instead of obeying God, broke God's commands. God commanded in the law of Moses that a Nazarite was to never touch a dead carcass. And yet Samson not only touched the lion's carcass after he killed the lion, he reached inside that carcass and took out honey and ate it, which was a sin of the highest order for a Nazarite. A man who was a womanizer, first taking a Philistine wife when he should have been taking an Israelite wife, then spending time with a prostitute in Gaza, and then living with Delilah outside of marriage, another Philistine woman. He was disrespectful to his parents. When they suggested he find an Israelite wife, he said, no, he wanted the Philistine woman. And then he rudely commanded his father to go get her for him. And only once in his whole story did Samson pray to God. And that was at the very end. And he prayed for vengeance against the Philistines. He didn't pray for his own soul. He didn't pray to serve God. He prayed for vengeance against the Philistines. Samson was definitely not a nice man. And yet, God's purpose for choosing him was to destroy the Philistines because they were a constant problem for the Israelites who were God's chosen nation. And they were sinful. They were evil. They worshipped all kinds of other gods. They obviously would kill people at the drop of a hat. They burned this woman and her father down in the house. So God wanted the Philistines taken care of and Samson went a long way toward doing that. Of course he might have gone a lot further if he raised an army like the other judges did like Gideon did, and Barak did, and Deborah did. But that wasn't, Gideon, that wasn't Samson's way. Samson was a loner. He liked to do things by himself, and he was powerful enough to do it. He didn't want to share the glory or the gratification of revenge with anyone else. And still, with all these things against him, we see God blessing him as he battled the Philistines, giving him victory after victory, even though he didn't even acknowledge that it was God 
who gave him those victories. The Spirit of the Lord coming upon him and giving him this incredible superhuman strength. In the end, Samson did finally acknowledge God. He prayed to God. He acknowledged his gift was from God. But he was still seeking revenge for himself, not for God. He finally at least acknowledged that he needed God to accomplish this one last great feat. He said, please God, strengthen me just once more. And God did. And because he did, Samson was able to kill all of the Philistine rulers, which no doubt crippled the Philistine nation for a time. Now, we know that it didn't destroy the Philistine nation because you move forward some years and you see David fighting the Philistines, right? Goliath was a Philistine. So you still had the Philistines doing battle. They even stole the Ark at one point, the Ark of the Covenant. So they were still around. But at least for a generation, the people of God, the chosen people of God, got some relief from this horrible nation that kept attacking them and ruling over them. And in the end, Samson was willing to actually give his life to bring down the Philistines. Not so much give his life for God, but to give his life for revenge. But by being willing to lose his life and asking God for the power to do this even though he was going to die by doing it, Samson almost inadvertently finally found redemption. Because Samson was then included in the heroes of faith list in the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews, after extolling the great faith of such righteous men as Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Moses, he wrote, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Samson did come to faith. His faith might have been wrongly pointed, but he came to faith that his power was from God and that only from God could he complete what to him was vengeance, what to God was purpose, which he gives all of us. So as a warrior, Samson was indeed one of the greatest as he used the special strength God had given him to battle the Philistines. And while he did so for selfish reasons and with little regard for God who gave him that strength, God supported him through it all as God does for us. He supports us through it all. And in the end, with his strength gone, chained in a prison, Samson realized that without God, without his gift, he was nothing but a weak and broken man. And so are we. Without God, we are nothing but weak and broken people. It took Samson 40 years to come to that realization. But when he did, he finally gave himself to God and he was redeemed for his faith. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Samson. He's an odd example because he's an example of how not to live our lives, but at the same time, he is an example of how to come to faith. 
He also is an example of how faithful you are. And Lord, we're thankful that you're faithful because we are broken and weak people. We have no way by ourselves of coming to redemption. Only through you are we able to do that. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ and our acceptance of him as our savior. So we thank you, dear Lord, for you are our good and loving God, always faithful, even when we are not. We praise you and we love you. Amen. It is now time for our communion. If the deacons could come forward, please. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me shall not hunger, and all who believe in me shall not thirst. We gather this morning with Christians around the world with the bread and the wine, symbols of nourishment and transformation in our Lord Jesus Christ. All who are believers in our Lord are invited to partake of this communion with us this morning. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would still our minds and quiet our hearts as we come to the communion table this morning. We pray that you will help us to confess our sins and clear ourselves of those things that trouble you. We pray you will draw us into an ever closer fellowship with you as we partake of this bread and this wine in grateful remembrance of what you did for us on Calvary's cross. We pray that you will bless this bread and that you will bless this cup and through this meal make us the body of Christ. The deacons will now pass out the elements of communion. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it after giving thanks. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I offer you this bread, take it and eat it, remembering that Christ is the bread of life. In the same way, he took the cup and he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you, 
For this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Ministering to you in Jesus' name, I offer you this cup. Take it and drink it, remembering that Christ is the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you willingly offered your body as a sacrifice for our sins. That you allowed your body to be broken for us and your precious blood to be shed to pay the full price for our sins. We pray that you will strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and help us to be more devoted in our love and service to you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Our final song this morning is Sing to the King. keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now may you go forth from this place carrying the love and the peace of Jesus in your hearts and sharing them with all whom you meet. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. <laughs>